Normally, when you learn about Schrodinger's cat, they describe the thought experiment, and I promise I will eventually, but they don't tell you that Schrodinger was using the cat to criticize an interpretation of quantum mechanics. They don't even tell you that there are interpretations of quantum mechanics, which means interpretations of reality, and that physicists don't even agree on reality, and I didn't even know any of this until I went down the rabbit hole. Thanks to Google Pixel 6 for sponsoring a portion of this video. Today is about explaining Schrodinger's cat to my production team. <laughs> you guys are included too, so I'll talk to you sometimes. What do you guys know about Schrodinger's cat? Essentially, the cat is both dead and alive. It's a good start. Cool. Schrodinger's cat was actually thought experiment meant to show how ridiculous quantum mechanics is. Really? But to start out, Schrodinger's cat is based on some really crazy physics, specifically something called superposition. So let's start there. Erwin Schrodinger in 1935 devised this thought experiment. I'm gonna give him a box out. Our cat has a 50% chance of dying and a 50% chance of still being alive. The implication is that the cat is in something called a superposition of alive and dead. It's not that it's alive or dead in here and we just don't know. It's that it is literally in this other state called a superposition. Does that make sense? Not officially. <laughs> I have another experiment that I think will help explain what a superposition means. Have you heard of the double slit experiment? Always helpful to have some diagrams. This looks like if you just had a wall with two holes in it and then you send a bunch of ping pong balls, I don't know, flying at the wall. So these are the two paths that they can take. Then they're gonna land on this side with two stripes, right? If you sent water waves, like a ripple would go through here. Then that breaks up into two sources. So it's almost like you have two sources of waves and two sources of waves interfere with each other. And I did that with two yoga balls in the water. We have two point sources of the waves yeah. and you end up getting those stripes because you have areas where the waves are canceling and areas where they're adding up. Sometimes the waves cancel, you get dark. Sometimes they add, you get light what's called these interference patterns. This is showing what waves do when you pass them through a double slit. Then this is the best part. What happens if we, <laughs> if we send electrons through the double slit? Would you expect to see like the two lines or the, the wave interference? I'm gonna go with the first one. I mean, that would make sense because they're particles. It would make sense, right? <laughs> but ta-da, you see waves. Like they sent those through? Individually. Individually. One at a time. Okay. Before we learn how that experiment is possible, a quick message. This portion of the video was sponsored by Google Pixel 6. As creators, you would be surprised how much we film last minute or in the moment on our phones. And the Google Pixel 6 is the ultimate tool for creatives looking to film an experiment or a candid moment with your editor. The Pixel 6 has some incredible, crazy tools like the Magic Eraser, which gives you the ability to remove annoying background objects like photo bombers or traffic cones from an otherwise clean, beautiful shot. The Magic Eraser tool is surprisingly easy to use, and all of this is powered with Google's own chip, the Google Tensor chip, which was designed for machine learning tasks. That's just the cool tech that I find interesting. You will notice the super clear four times optical zoom when taking photos, or you'll get to use the live translation that adapts to your language to help you understand and communicate in many other languages. And my Pixel 6 runs on the fastest 5G network, T-Mobile. It's the fastest Pixel ever on the fastest 5G network. Check out Google Pixel 6 Pro at T-Mobile. Thank you to Google Pixel 6 for sponsoring that portion of the video. And now back to how it's possible for electrons to act like waves. Like they sent those through? Individually. Individually. One at a time. Okay. And they're building up. And over time, they're building up not in two lines, but in this interference pattern. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's pretty that's weird, cool. right? Yeah. If we got one particle, how could it be creating an interference, right? That's the question. The electron can be in a superposition of going through the left slit and the right slit at the same time. And that's why we see the wave interference pattern. Watching back through all this, I realized that I'm missing something, which is that in person, I went on and on about how the electron is not a physical particle. It's this wave function that goes through the left and the right slit with some superposition and interferes with itself. And that's why you get the pattern, but it just got really long-winded, so I cut it all out. But the point is that the electron is not a physical particle, but the wave function is also not this physical thing. It's a mathematical entity that interferes with itself, and it's all very confusing. <laughs> 
This is a really groundbreaking experiment to show that electrons actually have wave properties. Yeah, how is it not just Battleship then? And it's in one spot. Yeah. And then we guess until we find it. You're like, as soon as you hit it and the other person says, it was only there because you guessed it. It's like, no, it was there. Guess the right spot. Yeah. If that were the case, then, then a few experiments that we see would act differently. So for example, the double slit experiment that I just explained. If the electron really were in just one place, then you would not get this interference pattern. Oh. But if you do all the math and you you figure out the wave function of the electron, then it makes a whole lot of sense why this probability cloud or whatever, this wave function is not an electron particle passing through one side or the other. It's actually going through both with some probability and interfering with itself. Here's one more twist to the whole thing. If you put a detector on the two slits to detect which side the electrons going through, then you end up getting just those two lines. You don't get the interference pattern anymore. So just your act of measuring, it affects the result of the experiment. So this is how the experiment went. It's a thought experiment, so it's not an actual experiment. No one actually did this. It's still alive for now. And this is a soundproof steel box. Then you put a radioactive substance in here, a bit of americium. And then imagine that it's tied to a Geiger counter. So the Geiger counter is gonna detect whether it decayed. Then the Geiger counter is tied to a hammer and the hammer is gonna hit a bottle of little vial of acid. If it decays, hammer hits the acid, releases into the box and kills the cat. But this is all happening when the box is closed. Our little sample of americium has a 50% chance of decaying and a 50% chance that it has not. Which means in here, our cat has a 50% chance of dying and a 50% chance of still being alive. Some people like to say sleeping and, al and awake, but does this look like sleeping to you? <laughs> the implication is that quantum mechanics states, it's not that it's alive or dead in here and we just don't know and we have a 50% chance of finding it either way. It's that it is literally in this other state called a superposition. If you're about to say that that's how the quantum world works, then yeah. like, that can make sense, but that doesn't technically make sense for our, it's like. Yes. So that was Schrodinger's point. I set out to tell you about Schrodinger's cat, and then I went down the rabbit hole of interpretations of what quantum mechanics means. We've got this math, but then people interpret that math in different ways. What's really going on fundamentally in reality is the thing that is still debated. Schrodinger's cat was actually Schrodinger saying, um, yeah, okay, so imagine this scenario. That's ridiculous, so quantum mechanics can't be right. And it actually wasn't quantum mechanics can't be right, it was an interpretation of quantum mechanics can't be right, specifically the Copenhagen interpretation. The most popular interpretation is this one that I've, I've said over and over called the, the Copenhagen interpretation. And that one involves superposition, it involves entanglement. This is the interpretation that we're taught in textbooks. Like I learned this in high school, and in college at MIT. It's the one that physicists sort of say is, is like real. They're like, yeah, superposition is real. Quantum entanglement is real. But 25% of physicists, like professional physicists, supported something else, not that interpretation. There was a survey in 2017 of about 150 physicists and 36% of them, so like a whole third of physicists said that they didn't have any preference for what was going on. They're like, here's the math. It's kind of like they gave up. They were like, it's really hard to figure out what's going on and here we are nearly 100 years later and we're still not sure what's going on, therefore it doesn't really matter. Like the math works out. And as I mentioned, there are other interpretations of what's going on. That, oh my gosh, I don't wanna go into this for too long. But there's an idea called many worlds and the idea is that multiple universes are created. I am so crudely describing this, but the particle that has a 50-50% chance of decaying, that actually creates a number of universes. Maybe there's infinite universes, but half of them will have a cat that's alive and half of them will have a cat that's dead. And therefore you don't even get this collapse of the wave function. Then there's other theories besides many worlds. There's a theory called the pilot wave theory where there's like a wave that is guiding an actual particle. Schrodinger helped come up with all of this, like this was partially his theory. The Schrodinger equation, his name is all over it. He thought the Copenhagen interpretation was so ridiculous saying like, okay, so you put a cat in a box and then it's in a superposition of dead and alive. I don't think so. Like it just seemed totally unrealistic to him, but we know for sure that at least quantum systems act in superpositions. What is really going on here? What is the reality here? What are we actually, what's actually happening? What's physically happening? And the honest truth right now is that we don't know. 
the physicists have no idea. So I know you've been watching this entire video being like, wow, that cat's really cute. I kind of want one of those. Well, guess what? You're in luck. <laughs> I'm so excited about these. We've been working on designing these little Schrodinger's cats for a year and a half. We also have these little Schrodinger's cat pets. Oh my God. Somebody make me um, less of a crazy sounding cat person. Okay, so here's the deal. These are on sale on our store, which is on the shelf underneath the YouTube video, but also on the URL on the screen. I was so excited. They're so cute. Oh, oh, and then these ones. Okay, yeah, this is the most, this is the coolest part. You can either get both of these or one or the other or you can get the Schrodinger option where you don't know which one you're gonna get. And if you never open the box, then you never know whether it's dead or alive and it'll stay in a super position. Your choice, your universe. There are unlimited options, really. <laughs> oh my God, they're so cute. I'm gonna buy them all. <laughs> I know what my whole family is getting for Christmas. I hope they watch my video so they know what, <laughs> what this is. <laughs> I hope you learned something because I certainly did in researching this video and we had so much fun making these. So I hope you enjoyed them too, even just in concept. Happy physicsing.